you were on the show last time. Uh, we talked about this wonderful success story in the little town of Ringe, New Hampshire, where Camp Constitution actually holds his camp. Uh, but give me some other success stories. <laughs> People are fighting back. Well, they, uh, this is the interesting thing because, you know, for all the years we were fighting this thing, I rarely heard from an elected official of any kind. Usually if I did, it was to deride me. But in the last three or four years, that's beginning to change. We are getting elected officials who get it, who understand what this is about. I was just in Michigan a week or so ago, and there were elected officials in my audience who came up to me afterwards and said, I had no idea. This is what I was voting for. I thought we were voting on some bike paths or something. Right. And so I've got a state legislator in Michigan. I'm going back up at the end of February. I'm going to meet with legislators in the city, uh, in the uh, state capitol. Same thing's happened with elected officials. They're starting, to, you know, I mean, uh, county commissioners and so forth are starting to get it. I did in April testify uh, before a committee in Maine on these things. And uh, so we're starting to reach there. And this is where it'll, it'll be, begin to turn the corner. We've got in, in the state of uh, Washington, state representative there, Matt Shea, who has put together a freedom coalition in the legislature. And he has passed just about 50 bills over the last three sessions, uh, working on it right now as well, that are all designed to cut the size, power, and, and, and reach of uh, cost of government. And so they're picking away at it that way. And we're working to try to get together a training seminar to um, uh, teach, uh, come up with a, a legislative plan and teach these legislators how to go about this, to be effective, to have teeth with it. So it's baby steps, but we're starting to get where we need to be, and that's with elected officials. So people who are listening, of course, this show is heard all over the world, and um, hopefully you need to be able to speak English to understand it. Thankfully, many people do, and it's not just happening in the United States. It's happening all over the world, right? Absolutely, yeah. And Agenda 21 means the 21st century, Agenda 2030 is that they hope to make some serious inroads by 2030. Are they trying to accelerate the agenda? Do you think that they're they figure we got to move we got to move the move the envelope, push the envelope a little because people are catching on? Or why do you think they had to repackage this? Yeah, that's exactly what I believe. I, I believe they're in a panic that they they have seen. They originally wanted this done. I think by by 2000 was was kind of their original kind of goal, and we've held it up. We've kept it back. You know, so I, I, and I, there, I've been told that, like, for example, the head of ICLEI USA told an associate of mine that they were terrified mm -hmm. of us because we have made them political poison. They can't get new cities to join them. And uh, so I think they do feel that, that they need to get this done and, and get it past us, at least get it to the point of no return. So, yeah, they're, they're, they're trying. Now, ICLEI is the International Council for Local Environmental Initiative, which was an entity formed before, uh, shortly before the Agenda 21 conference in Rio de Janeiro in 1992. I'm of the opinion that this is, uh, they call it an NGO, but if it's towns and cities and counties, isn't it more of a government-to-government -government thing than it is a private entity, even though there might be some private entities involved? If a city or a town or a, or a county belongs to this, isn't this a government to government entity? And aren't when towns are joining, isn't this a violation of the Constitution or Article, Article One, Section Ten, says states can't form confederations? Yeah, sure. And the uh, you know these the people who started pushing Agenda Twenty One when we started pushing back and they kept saying this is just voluntary. This it's just an right, idea, yeah. just a suggestion. Well, and, and of course, my favorite line they used on us was, "There are no blue helmeted troops at City Hall." Right, right. They try to ridicule. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. Well, but the well, point they don't, is, you know, my my opinion is, you don't need blue helmeted troops when you got people that have bought into this global agenda, this new world order, this one world government. The Constitution is outdated. You've had several generations of people have gone through public schools. You've had the UN Association. You've had all this propaganda in Hollywood and what have you, the new end is a great entity and we should embrace it. The Constitution is written by a bunch of dead old Eurocentric males. So you don't have to bring in UN troops. We're, it's like well, Khrushchev said, 
Khrushchev said, uh, your grandchildren will raise the flag of socialism. We don't have to come in. We're going to take it. We're going to get falling from within. Yeah, well, the thing is that they don't need blue-helmeted troops because they have the stormtroopers, the non-governmental organizations. These are the org- Sierra Club, the Nature Conservancy, the Audubon Society. These organizations wrote Agenda 21, and they then made it their, their goal to put it in place. And so they're doing it behind the scenes uh, in the back rooms of your city hall and your county commissioners. And, uh, you know, you, you, as I said, they come in with it all in a box and they have the money for it. And your elected officials, after they've heard this long enough, they begin to think this is the proper role of government. They don't even know any better. They don't know any and, better. And That's right. They put it, to, put it together. Yeah. They think this is, isn't this, this and this the way the world works. In Boston, what's interesting, I was, um, uh, doing picking up little what weekly neighborhood paper that uh, they you know free free of charge and it talked about it was very matter of factly like it, and the average person looking this is a big deal that the Rockefeller Foundation is partnering with Boston to promote this um, it's city of Boston belongs to one of these uh, international something cities about lowering your carbon footprint I forget that there's so many of them that you. Um, <laughs> And they're making a big deal about it. And I actually wrote a letter to them. And they ran my letter, and I said, here's the city of Boston that has a reputation of being pretty dirty. And uh, all of a sudden, we're going to reduce our carbon carbon uh, consumption by 15%. You can't even get the broken glass off the sidewalks, but we're going to reduce our, our carbon footprint by 15% in five years. You know, it's absurd. But, you know, again, people, uh, uh, people buy into it. And what's interesting, though, I think it's important, is that even in areas, liberal towns and cities where you think it's hopeless, even by when they, when they know there's opposition that they're being watched, I think it makes it a little more difficult. And I'll give a quick example. Keene, New Hampshire. Keene isn't too far away from Ringe, by the way, but you've got a liberal college town, and then you've got, uh, in Keene and Ringe, you've got a more uh, people been there for generations, you know, more conservative. But Keene, um, they almost defeated, uh, there was a vernal pool bill, where they were trying to get so many feet from a, and a vernal pool is whatever they determined it is. You know, it could be a puddle, but but they would they said 20 feet, 50 foot buffer, whatever it was. But they actually lowered that, and it was only passed by one vote. And I'm thinking, yeah, even in a liberal town, there's still hope and opportunity. And you may not get everything you want, but at least you're getting something. And you know what? But there are liberals who are against this too. Uh, you know, if I'm a liberal, I want to be. I work hard. Liberals work hard for their money. Most of them do, just like most conservative or whatever. I want to be able to use my property. I shouldn't have to have the government tell me I can't put a little duck pond or I can't put a little wharf by my little, um, or you know, uh, by my vernal pool if I wish. I'm a good steward of my property. I'm not. Gonna, I'm going to. It gets to the point where, like in Lexington, Massachusetts, I was. Uh, I'm a trustee of a piece of property there. And we were going to plant Virginia rhododendrons. Now, I know you've probably been smuggling them up when you come up to New England. <laughs> I drop them as I come along. But yeah. we had a you – know, you know, I was just uh, – wasn't involved in that. I said we were just going to upgrade the, the property. And so they said you can't plant Virginia rhododendrons because they're not indigenous to uh, New England. And I said we're going to stop chopping down all the purple beech trees that, you know, that are brought in from the, from the Orient. Or we're going to – you know, it's so ridiculous – you know, and, and and then you have to submit the plan, and just it costs two or three thousand dollars just to submit the plan to the town, and then it has to be some kind of public notice, and will people testify against your rhododendrons and what have you? Well, Virginia rhododendrons will not do any harm to the to, to, to the ecosystem. It will probably make it better, but they yeah. say no, and uh, it'll take uh, just some some ridiculous things. I, I have a uh, Ohio State Buckeye tree in my front yard in Virginia, which has made the Japanese beetles extremely happy. But uh, you know, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I've got well, we helping two minutes ecosystem left. all around. Yeah, I, we get two uh, minutes left. Um, how can people get a hold of you and um, learn about learn more about this? Well, our website, uh, we're the American Policy Center, and our website's AmericanPolicy.org. And uh, we've got a 15-year archive on there, articles on, on these subjects. You can learn a lot about it. We've got lots of tools we've created that some of them you can download right from the, uh, from the site. What, what I 
really try to tell people, you know, because it's such a huge issue to try to wrap your head around it. If you want to just really get it down to the basics, there are three ways they're attacking us here. They're attacking private property ownership. They are creating non-elected regional councils and, and regional governments, and they are funding it all through these federal grants. If you can begin to fight to protect private property rights, to stop the creation of these non-elected boards and uh, keep keep them as they did in Ringe, New Hampshire, and New Hampshire, to make it so that the, you cannot get a federal grant without a vote of the people, then uh, you can put a real monkey wrench into their plans and begin to slow this thing down. Well, again, thank you for being a guest on the show and.